Thank you everybody for joining. Um, thanks to my committee. Thanks uh, to Gerhard and Pankaj who are uh, online right now. Uh, unfortunately, the participants here cannot see you and you cannot see us. Uh, thanks, Pascal. And thanks, Xiaojun. Uh, no. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Dr. Shen, uh, for being here. Thanks for uh, all students of the Luis's lab and, uh, and the rest of Wright State uh, who, who joined me. Um, I'm going to give my dissertation talk today, which is about knowledge acquisition uh, within a system, and um, using the term system in a very broad manner here. So a system can be a group of people, a system can be a computer system, can be a large collaborative system like the World Wide Web. And when I talk about knowledge acquisition, um, First of all, I, I'm talking about it in a very uh, general manner as well. So I think all of us as individual humans or within such a system as I'm talking about, um, start off with some amount of knowledge that we already hold. And then we learn, we read, yeah? we're taught by others. Yeah? So somehow we extract information uh, from somewhere. And then that suggests new propositions to our mind or to a computer system, depending on what we look at. And then those new propositions have to be verified or validated uh, in order to be called actual knowledge. So, and then we add that to the knowledge we hold and can start all over again. So my metaphor for, for the circle is here, the uh, hermeneutic circle, which uh, is that you interpret text or knowledge in a cyclical manner based on the knowledge you already hold. You learn more things with those new things. You can learn again new things, etc. In my system that looks like that, we have background knowledge in the form of uh, formal ontologies or linked open data. We have lots of information on the web, uh, for example, on encyclopedias, uh, peer-reviewed journals, books, uh, web pages in general. We also have people who can just contribute uh, to generate knowledge. And then we have things that extract knowledge, algorithms, like one I will be presenting in this work. And then we have several um, proven means of validation of statements. There are like, logical validation, there is uh, Games with a Purpose, which is a community-based uh, validation. Uh, there are just people looking at pieces of knowledge and approving them uh, through discourse. And there's collaboration on the web in general. So, um, what I've done in my dissertation um, is uh, shown on this slide. It's more a slide of what I'm not going to be talking about today. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the dissertation covers. Uh, I think I have a pointer here. Which is the pointer? The center. Yeah, I, um, the dissertation. I talk about uh, some knowledge in general, like what is knowledge, etc. I talk about ontology design, yeah, but I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, then I talk about social processes from content creation, which I'm also going to be skipping today. However, I will be talking about uh, the centerpiece of my dissertation, which is uh, automated uh, knowledge extraction um, from, um, uh, from Wikipedia and from UMLS um, and from DBpedia, uh, etc. And I will be talking about uh, actually not really clear. we'll be talking about uh, social processes for knowledge validation. Um, I will not be talking about the knowledge merging part. Okay, so we'll be talking about what is knowledge, we'll be talking about how to acquire information, and talk about how to turn the acquired information into actual knowledge. Okay, so the larger context of automated knowledge acquisition is that um, we all need knowledge. We all need to 
know things uh, on a daily basis and need to know them quick. If we didn't know them five minutes ago, we may need to know them in the next minute. Um, there's this new term called knowledge workers, which pretty much means scientists, teachers, lawyers, like anybody who uh, makes his money uh, with using knowledge. And according to this study by McDermott, um, knowledge workers spend 38% of their time just searching for information. So if we can, for ourselves, yeah, for scientists like us, uh, get a way to speed up this process, take the search part uh, out a little bit, and get coffee now. Um, and help us understand the field quicker uh, by means of computational systems that give us an overview over a field of knowledge. Uh, that would be very beneficial. And then, uh, if those computer systems could not just um, write something down for us, but put it in a formal uh, semantic model that then can be used by computer systems or by humans uh, alike to filter information, to annotate, to do reasoning, Etc. Be great. I'm going to give a, a short uh, motivating scenario how we could learn about new things, how we go about it in general right now, and how um, my work in user could help us do that. So, let's say I don't know anything about India and I'm interested in that. So I Google that and I get some facts. Google has that now, it uh, gives me some facts. Yeah description, but it also gives me regular web results. And I like Wikipedia, I click on that, yeah, and uh, I see that uh, there have been multiple uh, conflicts uh, with Pakistan about the region of Kashmir. So I want to know a little more about that, because the Wikipedia page does not tell me everything. So I could browse Wikipedia, or I could uh, do another web search. And here, all of a sudden, I do not have any uh, factual information anymore. I, mean, I just get web results. Google cannot handle um, uh, factual information that involves more than one entity right now. So it would be really beneficial to get an overview at a glance uh, over a whole domain um, and use an automated uh, approach to create this knowledge uh, in form of models. And it is important uh, that, however we do that, the system is able to work with a rudimentary keyword description. Because very often, when we start looking at a new field of interest, at a new domain, uh, or a new research field, for that matter, we don't even know how to name things. We don't know the terms, really, that, uh, that we need to describe things. So very often, it's difficult to search for new things, because we don't even know what to search for. So, when I search user um, for India, Pakistan, and Kashmir, uh, I get an actual connected model here. This is, a, this is an excerpt of the, of the full model. Uh, and it kind of in the center shows the countries Pakistan and India. It shows some older and, and newer leaders. Um, it was extracted from an older uh, Wikipedia uh, set, so it's uh, doesn't have the latest uh, leaders in it now. Um, but interestingly, it shows something that is not even found on on, uh, on DBpedia or in the Wikipedia info boxes that the region of Kashmir, and it belongs to, to both uh, countries, India and Pakistan, as um, Wikipedia and DBpedia only tell us that Azad Kashmir or Jammu and Kashmir uh, belong to the to other country. So we're actually even just looking at this model, we could learn something. And of course we have to then verify. I uh, would check, oh, oh this, this region belongs to both countries. Oh yeah, that's why they thought about it. So I would uh, maybe use this model to filter further web searches. So I would get this slightly different uh, Google result. If I just use Google plugging terms in, I can get uh, slightly different search results. And I could um, 
I could record my click behavior and see which results I clicked and concepts that contributed to the particularly clicked result gain support in the model as a validation measure. And the user, of course, can also explicitly approve the content that is in the model. So we go from the user query to new knowledge, kind of without doing any extra work. So uh, to summarize that, the on-demand creation of domain knowledge uh, can improve the individual comprehension of an event, uh, but they're also easy to use in, in further computational tasks, in IR tasks, in information filtering, um, they could be used in annotation. And validated information could then be called knowledge, and that can then be given back to the community. So maybe we could uh, put the fact that um, the region of Kashmir is right now in, in both uh, Pakistan and India. Maybe that could go on DBpedia after it's been vetted by, by the community. So, a second. So this example was about an individual looking for more information about conflict. But uh, models can also support larger groups of people. Models can help, just like we're all familiar with ontologies, right? Models can be uh, a common vocabulary, a shared voca vocabulary uh, that helps people communicate, that helps people communicate uh, with systems, but that also helps systems communicate uh, amongst one another by knowing what, what to talk about. And uh, the, the depth of these models may also depend on uh, what the models talk about. So in scientific applications, we want a very in-depth description of the field, right? And it's usually narrow. And uh, it needs to be absolutely correct because, um, uh, partially because it's not only made for, for people to consume who could kind of verify uh, as they go along, but it is meant for annotation, it is meant for systems to communicate, it is meant to um, uh, use database, to annotate databases with it. Whereas in information filtering applications and kind of general uh, models, we want a more broad coverage of the field um, and just look for, for context. Uh, how, how it fits into what we know already. And it's mostly used to uh, communicate between people and people and uh, systems. Uh, so we can kind of verify the information as we go. And uh, relative correctness is therefore sufficient. Yeah, not 100% of the model needs to be absolutely correct. To create models, um, we can use uh, large models as a reference, like DBpedia, like Yago, UMLS, Mesh, the Go ontology. Um, but many of them are too big to be really usable um, for ad hoc tasks. You kind of need to be familiar with, with those models to find what you're looking for in the first place. Well, you can, that just, you can claim that, uh, you take a view of that, you take a subset of that by just giving right. a value on that. And yeah. you um, but the view usually depends on on the given classification that is provided to you by Go, for example, or by, by DBpedia. So, uh, whereas in uh, user's model extraction, it can pull from, like if, if you look uh, as knowledge as a plane, it can pull from many different sides and, and pull it together and form uh, the model that you look would you claim more so that uh, the uh, model that are kind of custom created involves uh, uh, such thing as uh, this India, Kashmir, uh, India, India, Pakistan thing that may not have uh, some common concepts and that focus may not be captured by general models? Well, or because it's there in something like the computer from which they will be created, that it is going to be captured anyway. Yeah. Well, so, so some things there 
would be harder to browse to. So, um, for example, I believe that region of Kashmir is classified differently from Azad Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir, so you may not immediately uh, get to it unless you go to the Wikipedia page and, and read the text. Um, also, there were concepts like line of control that will, on, on just the, the knowledge graph, be classified some clicks away from, from uh, the concept of India. So, um, yeah, I think I can claim that, that better graphs knowledge that is, uh, that is important for you. And that it is more difficult to, to collect everything that is important for you right off of DBpedia and, and Wikipedia as you browse it. I, th I think the argument that uh, a custom created, on, the, on demand created models uh, 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 you know, are different than just creating a sub view of uh, models that can be only occasionally created, large knowledge with occasionally created. So that that point would have been done. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I'm, um, I think I I hope I made the point when when I showed that some knowledge was not even available on on DBpedia uh, that, that we added um, because. Uh, DBpedia, all, all these models uh, that are available, they're actually very sparse. They contain a lot of information, but they're very sparse. When you just look at object properties, um, on average, DBpedia has about two object properties per entity, you know, two, two connections to other uh, entities. You know, they are not just data type uh, properties. So it makes it a very sparse graph. And, and it's still impressive when you look at the whole, but when you pick out a small sample, then you don't have much information in your small sample. So, uh, so in order to not be dependent on these, these large available formal models, um, we have to uh, get uh, our information from other sources, uh, which is available in great abundance, uh, like the knowledge that people hold, which, uh, and, and that they often do not put in papers, which is, uh, which is called tacit knowledge. Knowledge is available in scientific databases, or in free text, and, and peer-reviewed journals, in books, in, in papers, conference papers, and um, encyclopedias, uh, or the general web content. I'm uh, going to take a little step back and to say what kind of epistemological uh, background we need to call something knowledge. If we want to ensure that what is the outcome of the process could actually be called knowledge. And it needs to be made sure that uh, the entities we're talking about in the model actually refer to real world entities. So the functional definition for knowledge is often seen as uh, know-how. But it's a fairly weak definition yeah, um, that would encompass what we call actionable information. The more categorical and uh, classic definition of knowledge is that of justified true belief. Uh, well, is still everybody on Skype? There was some. Yeah. Okay. Was some problem yeah. there? Okay. Good. Still here. You can hear me well there? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Um, which is a very rigid uh, definition. It says that uh, in order for you to know a statement, you have to believe it first, you have to be justified in believing it, and the statement needs to be true. Okay. And in our case, uh, there's some, uh, uh, some discussion about that in literature. Um, I just call a belief a statement held by the system. The system cannot uh, really have a state of mind, so uh, a belief can be a formal statement that uh, the system has somewhere. Um, our justification procedures here uh, are uh, those of having trusted sources that can be extracted from, and extraction algorithms that uh, that generally produce uh, good results. 
and on top of that, uh, kind of deploy the wisdom of the crowds paradigm, uh, which means that we never, or the, that the algorithm never trusts a statement, uh, never trusts a single statement. It does um, what um, uh, what Tom Mitchell at, at CMU coined uh, macro reading. You need to extract statements from multiple sources. There is a uh, belief that people in general want to speak the truth. Some people lie. So, but if you find uh, a statement asserted by many people that were independent uh, on many different websites or in many different sources, the statement is likely to be true. And uh, of course, the validation uh, serves as justification. Uh, then there are some truth uh, theories out there. Yeah, people like uh, truth as correspondence. When we say that uh, something is true when it corresponds to a uh, state of affairs in the real world, yeah, which is a problem because the system definitely has no access to uh, to the real world, and maybe we as humans don't really have that access either. Yeah, we may make mistakes. So as a less normative and more analytical um, approach, there's the coherence theory and the, cons uh, the consensus theory, which says that a uh, statement needs to either fit uh, in a larger system of statements, uh, needs to be entailed by it or not contradict um, the other statements, or it should be agreed upon by most members of a group, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, even though all of these uh, truth assessments are, are fallible, I believe that in a cyclical model where you can always revisit uh, statements that, that your system holds, um, you will eventually uh, come to the bottom of things. Like if the statement is false, you will eventually find it uh, as being false. Um. One would argue that in the cyber physical systems, uh, uh, you could talk about the correspondence of this world. But, that, but yeah. for what you do, yes, that's fine. Well, and it is um, actually when when you read the, the literature, it, there's there are fierce battles between people who, who advocate theories. I, I think that's all a little uh, overdoing it. But there's something to be said about. Um, uh, Correspondence not being possible because uh, the, even the way we talk about things. So, by saying uh, this table is gray, uh, I may not actually have established correspondence. Yeah. Uh, for example, because um, gray is just the word for for the um, uh, for the light that is reflected of the table because of the surface structure. Um, Etc. There is no no tangible thing such as this color is what people would say. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to get get into that, but but there is a fierce debate about whether correspondence is actually possible. So, um, for reference purposes, especially, um, and and for uh, for practical extraction purposes, uh, the model creation itself uh, is both practically and conceptually split into the parts of domain definition and domain description. Um, the domain definition, what I call domain definition, contains concepts that uh, are identified by your eyes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. yeah? All, all of a sudden, I don't see slide numbers anymore. Oh. So until slide 24, I had slide numbers to refer to. but. Starting with this slide, I don't see a slide oh, number. I'm, I'm sorry. So I will ask you to call out the slide number if you don't have it on the slide. I don't have it on the slide. I'm sorry. I missed that totally because it did It's okay. Just call before. out the number and please He doesn't know the number. So okay. Uh, so we just say the slide. Yeah. The slide is called the main model dash reference. And I'll say uh, next slide then. Is, is the um, is the sharing a little too slow? No, it's not. It's, it's just that in, uh, in making notes and questions, I, I would want you to come back to a particular slide and uh, 
Um, it would have been nice if uh, we could say that this is the slide number we would like yeah. to go back to. Okay. But please go on. So, so this is, uh, yeah, this is 24. So, um, before the model is uh, conceptually split into that uh, domain definition and domain uh, uh, description, in definition we merely identify uh, what exists uh, in the domain, not how uh, things in the domain interact. So, it remains more static, uh, which uh, makes it easy uh, to, to contain proper references to, to the real world. So it refers to things in the world, just just the things like stripped of any of their um, of their properties. And the domain description is there, as the name says, to describe those concepts uh, with relationships with uh, attributes. And that is uh, subject to, to change. Yeah? And uh, I guess the the motivation could be an example for that. Yeah? So I'm sure there's a fierce battle uh, whether. Uh, the region of Kashmir actually belongs to, to both countries. Yeah. So, so uh, it's good that it can change. Okay, I guess I have to speed up here. So, practically in the concept, in the domain definition, um, we do top-down concept identification, uh, either manually or extract them from peer-reviewed corpuses such as Wikipedia or Mesh, the UML Semantic Network, etc. Um, corpuses that already contain uh, uh, conceptualization of the world. For the description, it is also possible to use uh, a ready-made model such as Stevipedia, but uh, as I said, these models are too sparse, so that's why we need to extract descriptions bottom-up from texts, uh, for example, yeah, as, as I will do, as I will show in user, or with domain-specific uh, readers, uh, as we did in, in an ontology uh, creation work. So, that. so the um, knowledge acquisition approach itself here is slightly different from traditional uh, knowledge engineering approaches in that it uh, follows both paradigms of of uh, engi uh, knowledge engineering and extraction. So we have the top down and the bottom up um, uh, definition and extraction in, in both of them. And then uh, we have a new form of validation as well. Okay. So the vision for uh, knowledge acquisition in, in a large system such as the web is kind of that we as humans uh, implicitly create models in our minds as we um, browse the web, as we learn about things, we would create new models. And what if we could just make these models explicit and reusable uh, using a formal description of it? And then as it's uh, validated, uh, it becomes knowledge. So we increase the overall knowledge by doing what we do anyways. We want to be lazy. So. The way my system, which I call user works, is does the domain uh, definition by carving a subset out of Wikipedia based on a user query, which produces the initial domain hierarchy, which then goes into the domain description, which does fact extraction to connect the concepts in the initial domain description. And subsequently, it uses um, some evaluation me uh, method to, to, turn thing, to turn statements into knowledge. I'm going to skip that. So running out of time. Um, I'm skipping the, the domain definition part because uh, that is also older work. Um, important for the domain description is that the, that it is concept aware. We don't uh, do information extraction simply on terms, but on concepts. You know? So fact extraction is seen as a classification of concept pairs into relationship types. You know? 
the relationships that a subject and object pair is classified into are those where the probability that the uh, relationship occurs with uh, the subject and object is greater than uh, a certain threshold. The classifier itself is a combined classifier, combined uh, of a language model and a semantic classification model. The language model is purely surface pattern based, which makes uh, it very fast. Uh, we have very little computational overhead, like many other um, Many other classifiers uh, use natural language processing tools, such as parsing, such as um, part of speech tagging. Uh, I don't do that here, which also makes the classifier open to any corpus. It is uh, basically also language independent. And the semantic classification model has uh, learned or assigned concept labels and semantic types um, to, to aid in the classification. The implementation is done within a probabilistic vector space model, which again makes things a little faster and, and uh, very elegant to handle actually. So a relationship um, is there defined by a vector of pattern probabilities and uh, a vector of domain and range probabilities. And the concepts are grounded, uh, as I said before. A nice feature of that is that the results are easily verifiable. That is a feature of both the vector space model and the probabilistic model. Um, I can easily go back from an extracted result to where exactly it came from, which is much harder when you use uh, more sophisticated models such as uh, uh, conditional random fields, for example. Um, this is the classifier. Yeah. It and takes as input a subject object pair, collects its labels, sees where the labels occur with patterns, also collects the semantic types of subject and object, and then takes um, joint uh, probability uh, computation over all of them okay, for all the occurrences of patterns and labels. Um, most of all, the probability of seeing a, a certain relationship when you see a certain pattern, and the probability that um, a term actually indicates the subject and the object, uh, uh, respectively. So I have a question. So, so is the label independent of, of the type? The label is independent of the type. Yeah. So you can have the same label for two different types? Um, well, the, the types. So by label, do you mean the, the types are not really labeled. So the types are the classes, right? Right. So the so same name can appear in two different types. I mean, is that why there is no link between them? Right. So, so for the types, actually, the, the label is is not relevant at all. The the label just denotes the, the immediate uh, subject and object concepts yeah, or entities. And those are English so, words. Those are English words. Yeah. So, so subject. Um, could be, um, I don't know, um, 2012, and in parentheses, film, yeah? indicating that there was a movie called 2012. Yeah? Um, in text that will appear as just 2012, but many other things will appear as just 2012 as well in text. It will, be, it will appear as the movie, 2012, uh, etc. So, um, that appear in text, and um, I compute over Wikipedia how likely it is that uh, the term uh, actually expresses that um, that unambiguous uh, concept that is then the subject and the object by by counting the the anchor texts that that link to the subject and object, and by counting which anchor texts link how often. So yeah, so there. That then makes the, the probability of actually seeing or actually talking about the concept when a term is seen. So 
So I'll, I'll give an uh, example about that. So um, when I query, for example, how is Barack Obama related to Columbia University, I find one example sentence uh, in the corpus that says, I graduated in 1983 from Columbia University with a degree in political science, etc. First of all, we're only interested in the first part of the sentence. And then you can see, so, um, probability of seeing the alma mater relationship between Barack Obama and Columbia University um, is equal to the probability of seeing the alma mater relationship with that general pattern, something graduated in 1983 from something. Probability of seeing the entity Barack Obama, when we see the term Obama, and not a village in Japan, which is named Obama. The probability of seeing Columbia University, the concept, when we see the, uh, the phrase. Uh, the probability that the domain of alma mater is person, and the probability that the range of alma mater is academic institution. And um, just add up these, uh, just multiply these probabilities and uh, come up with uh, an overall probability. It's a fairly uh, uh, simple classifier, works well. The, um, the problem with, with pattern-based uh, extraction is that there's usually a low recall because patterns, then some very heavily used patterns are uh, very sparsely used. So one way to avoid that is just uh, to, to generalize those patterns. And since I don't do any POS tagging or, or parsing, um, I can also only do um, uh, wildcard generalizations. So the way it's done is um, any token in a pattern is replaced by a wildcard, and then probabilities of the pattern uh, indicating the relationship are uh, recomputed. And so, for example, this uh, lowest uh, pattern, where just subject starts to start from object, will just get a very low probability of indicating anything. But this one here, subject graduated in star from an object, um, has very much the same probability of indicating the alma mater relationship as uh, it had when it was more specific with the, with the year in it. So that was the generalization. Um, the way I learn the pattern probabilities is uh, by distant supervised training. So, the problem with, uh, with Wikipedia and with DBpedia is uh, we don't actually have an annotated corpus. I don't know exactly what is in each sentence, right? which, which uh, relationship appears. With Wikipedia, we have some advantage that sometimes we see actual links to entities in a sentence, but that also does not happen very often. So um, we can only guess which relationship is indicated uh, by which pattern. But statistically speaking, we should get uh, the right patterns uh, with the right relationships. So uh, the way it works then is the probability of, of seeing, so the first step is the probability of seeing a pattern when I see a certain relationship is by um, taking the intersection of uh, the pattern occurrence uh, when this relationship is meant divided by um, all other pattern occurrences with that relationship. However, since we don't really have access to that due to the lack of annotation, uh, what we can do is uh, the probability of seeing uh, pattern J with uh, the relationship I is look at all the, uh, all the triples in the training data that had RI in it, look at all the labels that we know for subject and object, and look in text and see which pattern occurs with uh, this label here. Yeah. And then divide that by uh, all pattern occurrences with that label here. Then the next step is to traverse it. Um, and since uh, there is a uniform distribution of relationships uh, assumed, um, I can uh, simply normalize uh, 
the pattern and given relationship probabilities by, by the sum of uh, uh, all the um, uh, relationship probabilities and, oops, and get the probability uh, of a relationship seen in a pattern. And these relationships for implementation purposes are then converted to a vector space representation where uh, the ij, IJ uh, field in the matrix is the probability of seeing the relationship i given the pattern j. So the main problem we run into in, in classification is that of relationship similarity. By the way, we're at slide uh, 44. Oh, the, okay. So the numbers are actually not correct on the slides. Good. Okay, as long as there are numbers on the slides, let's, let's use those. I forgot that. Um, a big problem in, in uh, training the classifier is the relationship similarity that we don't know about uh, because it's simply supervised training. So. Getting people actually, so someone has, you can ask them to turn off their microphones. Um, so, Gerhard Pankaj, does any of you have uh, have something on in the background? No, no, they can, they can yeah, mute their, their phones uh, uh, if they want to release the echo. Yeah. Can, there, there's some echo. Can, can you mute the microphones? Uh, I can do this. Oh, that's, that's all right. I'm occasionally uh, uh, browsing through the printout of the slides. Ah. So, um, biggest problem we're running into when uh, training is that of, of uh, similarities between relationships that the training data does not really tell us about. So there's what I call extensional similarity means uh, where semantically different relationships can share subject and object pairs in the training data. Mm -hmm. So people can be born and live and die in the same place. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have X born in Y, X lives in Y, X died in Y uh, in the training data. And because of the distant uh, supervision in the training process, uh, the same patterns would be extracted for, for all of these relationships. Um, and then there is intentional similarity, yeah, which uh, means that there is an actual overlap in meaning of the relationship types. Yeah? So uh, things that are physical part of something are a subset of the things that are part of something. So, but again, with um, with training data such as DBpedia, this is uh, this particular. Uh, subset relationship is a priori unknown, and so we kind of also have to learn that from, from the data. So, but intentional similarity causes semantically similar types to compete for the same patterns, to compete for the probabilities of the, the same patterns, which brings down the probabilities uh, for, for both uh, relationships, which is not desirable. So, so I've used uh, what is called the pertinence measure. Yeah. Um, and we assume that there is more of a, uh, yeah, more of a, a probability space where, where uh, the, relation, the different relationships can share uh, these probabilities. And the idea is, uh, very practically, to not punish the occurrence of the same pattern with relationship types that are intentionally similar, but are extensionally dissimilar. So the naive way of computing uh, the probability of seeing a relationship given a pattern was uh, this term here. But now we can um, just reduce the impact of extensionally and, and increase the impact of intentionally similar relationships by weighting the denominator of the probability computation here. And the function that computes the relational similarity, simrel, between uh, the relationships Rk and Ri, um, 
it's composed of a formula that computes the intentional similarity and one that computes the extensional similarity between two relationship types. Yeah. The intentional similarity is computed as, uh, as the cosine of the relationship vectors that were mentioned earlier. And the extensional similarity is pretty much just a uh, the fraction of overlap between the training data of two different relationship types. And this causes um, the probabilities for the patterns to look like this. Yeah. So we have um, very high probabilities of a certain pattern indicating many different kinds of relationships and uh, that also sum up to more than, than one. But it never causes the joint probability of the relationship given the subject and the object to be greater than one. That will never happen. And uh, here's an example uh, how uh, the relation similarity computation, pertinence computation um, uh, affects um, the similarity of relationship types. So when I, for example, see um, relationships that were previously um, intentionally uh, dissimilar, they're made a little more similar. Yeah. But when I see uh, relationships like, oh, sorry, since you cannot see the laser pointer, like the, the first block, family, genus, order, class, order, and family, uh, are relationships that have low extensional similarity, uh, but have slightly higher uh, intentional uh, similarity, and that is boosted a little bit by the, by the pertinence computation. Whereas in the second block, producer, artist, etc., cetera, um, we have a very high uh, extensional overlap, and that is uh, reduced in the, in the last column in the relational, overall relational similarity. So that, uh, that definitely helped. And we can see in the uh, precision recall evaluation of uh, running fact extraction with and without pertinence. Uh, pertinence, uh, even though in the beginning does not achieve higher precision, uh, maintains higher precision through the high recall areas. And so so it, uh, it definitely helps the classification by not letting um, relationships compete for, for the same patterns. And uh, further on in the, in the evaluation, I uh, split uh, between DBpedia uh, gold standard and BMLS gold standard. Um, DBpedia, uh, so this year we achieved um, very high precision for, for some relationship types. You see the, the maximum precision goes up to 100% uh, uh, for, for, the, for the best performing relationship types and is on average up to uh, about 0.7 uh, or 70%. These are some, some examples of that. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, you can see uh, that um, actually we thought we extracted uh, the wrong uh, relationship. For example, in, um, in the midnight oil species diseases uh, case, where the suggested relationship from DVPedia was artist, which was uh, identified as second relationship, um, but they actually are also the producer of uh, that particular album. So, so both were correct. Uh, similar for uh, an evaluation of, of the UMLS data set uh, as a gold standard, uh, the curves are a little steeper, and the reason is that uh, patterns on uh, that were identified on uh, using UMLS on the uh, Medline data set uh, tend to be a lot more specific than those on general text. Uh, also some, some uh, sample results. When we compare uh, the user system to, to others, I'd like to compare to, to Mintz and, and uh, Snow and Jurafsky. Uh, because it is very similar uh, in terms of, of training procedure. They use distantly supervised training. They use the same same data that I do, basically the same data. They use uh, Freebase instead of DBpedia. So that is pretty much the same thing. Um, but they use uh, um, 
a much more involved classifier than, than I do. And uh, they fare comparably well, but uh, when I run user with uh, pattern generalization, I tend to get uh, uh, high precision uh, throughout higher recall, which, which is nice to have. Then uh, I did a, quantita a qualitative evaluation of on-demand creative models. I quickly ran um, uh, queries for Semantic Web, for Harry Potter, for Beatles, for the India Pakistan relations, which we have seen in Excerpt of. Um, the financial crisis and the uh, German chancellors. Um, you see the number of, of concepts that are in each of the models. They're so medium size. Um, the precision of just the concepts is fairly high. I've determined that uh, that fraction of concepts actually does belong to the domain. Okay. And the precision of your relationship extraction um, is also quite high, especially when we uh, require fairly high uh, confidence from the classifier. But it also depends on, on which uh, model we're looking at. Um, recall cannot easily be computed, so I, I thought I'd come up with something called relative recall, where, say, the most that can be extracted with the lowest threshold is 100%, and just see how uh, how the recall then behaves. So um, it does not mean that with respect to the actual domain I get 100% recall. Okay. Um, there's a lot of related work uh, when it comes to information extraction. And I can classify that into those that use surface patterns only, yeah, which is uh, uh, verb ocean without dirt, uh, Snowball, um, then there's uh, Turney's work um, uh, on analogy of uh, computation. Um, these are all supervised uh, techniques, whereas others are. And then out of those, these are distantly supervised uh, techniques. And there's uh, the work that I compare to. And there's Nell, which is uh, the Read the Web project at, uh, at CMU. Um, Nell also uses a uh, coupled learner, um, uses the knowledge from, from the main models uh, to classify uh, the relationships. Um, only Turney also uses uh, the semantic pertinence uh, related, uh, computation. Uh, and then what is different is uh, that uh, I call my way of, of extracting, or my way of extracting relationships is called uh, called relational targeting, and then there are structural targeting, open relationship extraction, which is uh, what, for example, Kartik Ramakrishnan did, and uh, his text runner, and, and other work from um, from the University of Washington in, in Seattle. So the main differences between this work and others is uh, we only have surface patterns, only use positive training examples in a distinctly supervised approach. Um, use a pertinence measure for semantic similarity, and it's uh, concept aware. Comes concept first, then labels of concepts. And, uh, so, it's good uh, late work. And so, it achieves uh, very competitive precision and recall uh, while still being computationally feasible. Cannot really compete with uh, some NLP based approaches. But on the other hand, when you look at results from NLP-based approaches, they often just um, they often just measure how well they split sentences into uh, structural subject, predicate, and object, rather than seeing how well they actually identified relationships between entities. So very often the, the is that what the question is? Oh no, it's just the, the type. The, the way that people evaluate. So, for example, the University of Washington work, uh, which I was always in awe of because they have a fantastic uh, precision and recall. They put their results online, and many of the sentences that they identified as correctly extracted uh, were without a reference or just with a pronoun. So, um, she walked home, which does not mean anything other than in 
very specific context. Or it had other non-reference, like um, six out of 11 countries left uh, the conference. Yeah? That does not mean anything either, other than in context. So um, sometimes evaluation is is correct within a specific scope, and they evaluated how well they split sets. That's because you start with the concepts first, and then you are... And I start with the concepts, so, and, and I make sure that in the evaluation, I, I see that the right relationship is between the, the actual concepts that are taken from uh, from the domain definition. Can just can just uh, they learn from uh, that observation and improve the, uh, the way they do it? Well, I mean, it, it would give uh, lower results for, for their work, so I'm sure people like to evaluate in a way that that it's honest, but gives them best results. Right? Okay. Yes. So, and uh, what is also different is uh, the different types of background knowledge that are used there incorporated into one statistical frame, uh, framework, um, this combined model does not do like, a reasoning after extraction. It's, it's all within one, uh, one classifier. So uh, the last part is about um, knowledge validation in an application. Yeah, so uh, we were asked by the Air Force Research Lab, uh, by Victor Chan, some of uh, you still know him, um, to create uh, a system that uh, operates on, on a knowledge model of the domain of human performance, human cognitive performance, and where we can browse uh, scientific literature in a focused manner using um, using this this uh, human performance model. So what we did was um, we extracted the hierarchy for the cognitive science uh, domain. Uh, based on a large number of, of keywords that was given to us. There was a fairly curated set, so this is a little different from these ad hoc creations. Um, and, and got this, uh, well, this is actually still a subset of, of the uh, extracted hierarchy. But uh, you can see that this is a tree map model. Inclusion means a subclass relationship. So you kind of tell there are many, many things in there, and, and the purple ones are entities, the yellow ones are classes. And then uh, used a user uh, with a language model or with a classification model that was trained on, um, on UMLS uh, to extract relationships between uh, the extracted uh, concepts, and that is something that we got, yeah? and we had that manually evaluated by, by the domain experts there. And um, the outcome was that we got overall 79% uh, uh, extracted relationships that were at least somewhat correct. Yeah? And we got about 30% 30, 30 of all, all the relationships, so uh, almost half, um, a little less than half of all the correct ones was deemed uh, correct information that is not commonly known and was interesting to, to the scientists. So even though we're extracting from their fields, we extracted things that they had not come across before. We did not find any new knowledge because whatever we extract is is in the literature, but they had not yet come across that. So it kind of put them ahead, which which was very nice. Um, then I went back and uh, looked at the, the patterns um, that actually um, produced those, those results that were incorrect or correct. And here I'm plotting, um, here I'm plotting uh, the, the confidence of the algorithm versus the, uh, the quality uh, given by, by the domain experts. You can see that um, like the best results were also extracted with very high confidence by the, uh, by the classifier. However, unfortunately also some of the wrong ones um, were extracted with fairly high confidence. 
So that means that uh, both high quality patterns and some noisy uh, patterns have high indicative power. Uh, and that is often because those, those patterns that were used to extract both the really new information and the wrong ones um, are in the long tail of the uh, pattern frequency or pattern probability uh, distribution, actually the pattern frequency distribution. So with a distantly supervised approach, it's very hard to tell um, tell this noise apart from, from interesting things. And, and that is actually a problem that, uh, that is encountered in many, um, many classification tasks. To, to separate the interesting from, from the noisy. So, and looking at specific errors, yeah, so the, the most common errors were that the extract relationship was too specific or the too specific relationship went in the wrong direction or was um, somewhat metaphorically correct. Yeah? So we have, um, we have this relationship here and or this fact, the interpretangular cistern um, relationships disease has associated an atomic side um, and the anatomic side is the cerebral preduncle. That is incorrect because it's not a disease. But otherwise, has associated anatomic site would be correct. So it, it went too specific and then in the wrong way. And sometimes it has incorrect uh, directionality, uh, where the relationship should just be the other way around. And that tends to happen when uh, direction is expressed in the context rather than, than in the sentence uh, itself. So those were um, some of the errors. So to the validation, and so um, to get to knowledge, we can do this kind of thing, what, what the experts did, yeah, just uh, score all the facts. Yeah, that's what I would call explicit validation. It could be done by thumbing up or thumbing down as well. We could also do implicit validation, which kind of happens along the way by analyzing click strings. In explicit validation, we have a lot more certainty. And we know exactly which statement was evaluated, uh, what it stood for, etc. Um, and we can usually tell that the validator has good credentials. But it is always extra work. People have to do something to, to thumb up uh, the statement, a piece of knowledge that has been extracted. And sometimes people may not want to do that, so we may want to at least weed out some of the wrong ones by finding indications of correctness just based on the way that people interact with the knowledge that was extracted. So uh, assumption here is that every action taken on a piece of information uh, means something, therefore it's recorded and the behavior is then, um, then analyzed. So. There are some, some good examples for uh, implicit validation uh, in the literature, and there's uh, Games with a Purpose, and there's Google Search Rankings, of course. And uh, we did that using the, uh, the Schooner Semantic Browser that uh, was developed in the lab. Uh, Daryl was uh, there, Alan was, was in there, on uh, the Schooner development. So, and Schooner uh, allows us to browse literature along facts that are asserted in the model. And the assumption for this validation is that the browsing trail may suggest something about the correct extraction. And there are uh, some considerations. Yeah. The fact is browsed very often. Uh, it's a good indication that it's correct, but it could also just be an interesting piece of information. If I, if I find uh, uh, a fact stated somewhere that, that smoking is actually healthy, I will click on that. Yeah? And then I will quickly go back because I can see that that is wrong. Yeah? So, um, yeah, so, so some facts that are clicked off may just be incorrect. So, but if you look at longer trails, you have a much higher indication that people were interested in the facts along the way. So if, if I browse a trail of three facts, then it is likely that two of them at least were, were correct because I would have otherwise stopped earlier.
And we can actually see that in, in the way people use Schooner. So, uh, for example, we search for, for something on, uh, on Medline using Schooner. Yeah. Choose an entity of interest, browse a relationship that uh, has uh, that subject, and, and choose, choose an object, record this fact, and do the same for another fact and another fact. And uh, we can see that through browsing, uh, the expert arrived at um, a connection between uh, this peptide, vasoactive intestinal peptide, VIP, and contextual fear conditioning, which was something that the uh, AFRL people wanted us to uh, be able to find. So it is likely that uh, at least the two first uh, ones were correct, not all two, tri all three triples in that, in that fact. And unfortunately, we don't have uh, all that much data from from browsing uh, that the uh, experts at the FRL gave us. But uh, I could uh, extract some some browsing data, and I could see that uh, some relationships were accessed a lot. Uh, others were accessed less. All those that were accessed a um, lot, more than 10 times, um, were correct. And, or had, or were kind of trivial when I say no truth value is, is this trivial because it's just class membership. So even though that is not, I think, statistically valid, this, this uh, evaluation here, gives us some, some anecdotal evidence that um, simply looking at browsed facts can give us a good indication whether a fact could at least be right, and thereby maybe just weed out some uh, the lower end here that we don't need to show uh, to people to explicitly validate. But there's also some uh, related work to that. So, the nice thing about using semantic models that were ad hoc created for knowledge acquisition is that the model reflects the interest of a user at, at, that, at the point of creation. So that may lead the user to actually help us validate the facts. And the user may just also just use the model at that moment, which again helps validate the facts. So. Um, so there's this willingness to create new knowledge. And when the validated statements can be merged with existing statements, could be back in the linked open data cloud, for example, then the, <coughs> excuse me, then the automated knowledge acquisition task would be completed. And an individual driven knowledge acquisition task actually improved the overall system. And so just by you, searching for something for yourself, you may be able to improve the overall knowledge available on the web, which is nice. Right. In the future, I'd like to add uh, an active learning component to the system to get rid of some of the, the errors. So when there is actually feedback from the user, they can go back and uh, to fix, fix that in the patterns. Um, that has been done in Nell. Nell has a website where you can actually vote on, on uh, extracted facts. And uh, then I'd like to improve the, the depth of the classification because work there that I've seen uh, is, is by Navigli, uh, where they create uh, taxonomies from scratch and from the results. It seems like very high quality taxonomy that is being just created from from text and query to the text. And then I'd like to look into um, belief updates and model evolution, something that uh, we also call continuous semantics, where I looked at um, how a model changes with a changing event, you know, so that the model can be updated as the event changes. So I've seen that slide before, those are contributions I, I made towards um, towards the dissertation and the publications that I 
finally, um, some of the people I worked with, uh, I went through different schools where at first uh, Dr. Sheff uh, and, and some of us still were in, in Athens, Georgia at the LSDS lab, um, where we collaborated, at least where I collaborated with the Complex Carbohydrate Research Center, uh, UGA. Then I worked with uh, Pankaj at uh, at uh, HP Labs and uh, with uh, Gerhard at the um, MPI, uh, Max Planck Institute uh, Informatics. And uh, the tools and ontologies, etc., that came out were, um, well, like that I did not show, and uh, the user plus plus system that I hopefully explained well in depth today. So. Thank you very much to my committee. And see what the external numbers look like. You know all the rest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, thank, you. thank you very much for listening. So, questions? Do students have any questions? Uh, just to, just, yeah. Uh, on slide 71, you had uh, noise kind of. Uh, uh, showing up as being confident by confidently recognized by the system. Yeah. So, do you think uh, there is any role of uh, uh, prior probabilities here to kind of take out the noise? Like considering existing domain knowledge to kind of mm. initialize your prior. Would that happen? Well, um, I assume that at, at least for the relationships themselves, do not have prior probabilities. Uh, I ran the, those tests like, when I actually um, uh, weighed the, the relationships by kind of their frequency, I get much better results. But it is then just corpus dependent. And since uh, since we since I assume that I actually use linked open data to train the system, so linked open data. Uh, I like to see as streaming data, so there's always new knowledge added, and we never know um, in which direction it, it goes next, which relationships will be explored further. So when you look at, at Wikipedia and DBpedia, uh, for example, you may think that um, the world consists of, uh, of sports people yeah, and, and their relationships to their to their uh, to their teams, which is not correct, right? So that's that's why I think this is too skewed and say, well, the more relationships uh, we encounter in, in the world and the more are then added to, to linked open data, the, uh, the more irrelevant the prior of the relationship becomes and, and the more it goes, like, the prior for each relationship would go towards zero anyways, yeah, because we have so many. Uh, so yeah, no, no prior probabilities. Everything's conditional. My question is about the practical aspect of using this word. Um, so let's suppose for, uh, if you want to apply an user for um, application like a disaster domain, for example. Yep. In that case, can Wikipedia be replaced with other knowledge sources? Um, and other knowledge sources I mean uh, by um, the trusted sources like the websites of uh, disaster response teams across the world in addition to like the web pages. So I think Google Knowledge Graph is kind of trying to do with web pages because um, in this work also, like we are not using a relationship as a structural relationship, but rather we are exploiting from Wikipedia for the text. Right. So a good cluster of web pages linked together, can that be utilized here? Um, uh, and will that be kind of improving? I mean, what's your thinking? Um, I'm not sure, so for my future work I said I'd like to do something that extracts also uh, primary conceptualization from just from text, but um, I do believe that the, the web pages that you're looking at um, will have information there once, maybe twice. It's not repeated. Um, for, uh, for quality control, the system assumes that, that a statement is made often right, in order to be extracted. 
but you could tune it to have uh, only only one statement being sufficient to, to be extracted, that uh, then you don't have high enough certainty. I've not looked at just a, a page structure to, uh, to, um, to extract relationships yet, no. I, that's what you suggested as well, right? Mm -hmm. So the only thing will be, um, is the user study only the way to validate what we got? Or do you have any uh, thought on that, how we could validate oh. what we get? So, um, I think so when, when you talk disaster response, right, you're, you're also talking about uh, social media being used, Twitter being used. Right. So uh, you can see that if there's a, if there's a response, that is spawned by something that the system extracted, uh, a tweet being sent by, by something that the system sent out automatically uh, in, in response to that by a person, that could be seen as, uh, as an indication that it was a correct uh, extraction as well. But I mean, in, in a disaster, especially in a disaster response scenario, you don't want to play around with those things. Right? So, you want correct information to be sent out. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't see it yet in an immediate disaster response scenario. Well, uh, if the information is consumed by the human, then it's okay to have some errors anyway. Yeah. I think that one very, um, out of the, uh, I don't know whether this will work at all or not, but uh, worth considering um, an idea of combining something like Duzer with uh, something like Quarkle um, and or you know dynamic and, and whereby uh, from the streaming data you are constantly extracting entities using background knowledge to enhance it further particular relationships uh, validating in the data itself and then uh, continue to add to the model uh, oh. and if it can be done in a even a uh, you know continuous way uh, much more rapidly than uh, what we've done now that would be very exciting or very unique now I don't know how what Quality that would be, and but we worth uh, trying out as a research experiment. Pavan and I put something like that together before, right? so, and we got some preliminary results on that. Um, interesting result was when we analyzed. Uh, did you forget? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we did that. Uh, that, I, uh, that, that, but that still had a, a good bit of. Elements of yeah, yeah, but to, and that is why he told yeah. preliminary results. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I mean, there, there were some interesting results. For example, uh, we found so we kind of simulated the, the evolution of the model by collecting the tweets over the week and then um, giving user only uh, the the terms of the tweets for one day to, to create the model, yeah. and uh, we saw that. In some in some cases, the model evolved towards the right way to classify tomorrow's news. There was something about the palace or yeah, yeah. I think Cairo suburbs the and we found about million person match Cairo suburb gave some yeah. Suburbs. Heliopolis was yeah. a Cairo suburb. So Heliopolis, yeah. yeah so. so Heliopolis came up in no, I I I I remember that one day's model and the next but day uh, Heliopolis was. What I mean here really is. That was done kind of day at a time and, and uh, you know in a time interval. I think that can be even more continuous form of it and uh, visually displayed to see that hey, as the event evolves, um, the knowledge evolves uh, as you know kind of two stream. <laughs> here is a data stream going on. Here is the understanding of the knowledge that keeps on adding new things and uh, changing and uh, things that most active. That that is that is the reason I. Uh, took up Wikipedia, just the event page as the work which I'm doing right now is taking Wikipedia, uh, just the event page, uh, rather than taking the whole Wikipedia to see how events are changing. Mm. Uh, yeah, probably. Okay. I would like to say something again. Yeah. Uh, I think around the question of evolving data, there are two types of uh, future opportunities and uh, perhaps also some comments from Christopher here needed. One is that, you know, for very plastic relationships, uh, where the uh, open world continues to add evidence, either in support or uh, 
uh, contrary to what the relationship uh, support is, right? Mm. Uh, the evidence framework that uh, he has presented, uh, which is somewhat Bayesian in nature, although he pointed out that the probabilities in the denominator don't sum up to one, uh, I think it has the ability to uh, fuse uh, new evidence in support or in contradiction of uh, existing relationships. Uh, so long as uh, some notion of inconsistency is introduced, in the sense that you know a person cannot be born on two different uh, in two different years, uh, and if you are learning both, then somehow adjusting that evidence, uh, which is in the current pertinence model that's not captured, and this perhaps a direction for future work. Correct. And then the second thing which was, um, I think, just being discussed is about situational relationships. So, uh, uh, Christopher, during your talk, you gave examples of some of the deficiencies of text runner, where uh, certain relationships were using dialectic uh, references to the environment, uh, such as a person is at some place or leaving some place, uh, which is a, a fact uh, that is true in a moment, but is not generally true. And it leaves its relationship footprint, but that footprint is transient. I would like you to comment on both uh, how you see your work being applied and some of the directions that you see for future integrations and future work uh, along these two lines. Okay, so let me uh, answer the first uh, first question about uh, kind of cardinality of a relationship being captured uh, by pertinence um, and, and how that could be learned. Um, there, I don't think uh, the pertinence uh, formula is, is able to capture that, that a person cannot be born in, in two places at the same time. Um, but I do believe that this can easily be weeded out with, uh, um, with some reasoning afterwards. Yeah. So, so just just a consistency checking of, of these relationships. Now the problem is, how do we know that uh, a person can only be born in one place? Yeah. And depending on, on the data set, that may not even be, be correct because it may use the same, uh, same relationship type to, to indicate a uh, person was born in Dayton, person was born in Ohio, person was born in the United States. So um, that is difficult to find. And uh, I believe with, uh, there, there has been some inductive logic programming work on, on identifying uh, domain range, etc. Um, that I think could be, could be applied. But, I think uh, with the kind of data set that I'm looking at, especially with LOD, um, it would still have to be a probabilistic model. But uh, now I kind of forgot uh, the beginning of your second question. Did, did I answer your first question? Yes, you did, and I think ILP is a great suggestion. I think the second question was more about uh, relationships that are reflective of uh, transient facts. Um, so facts oh. that are only true in a particular oh. situation in a moment. Okay. Yeah, that um, that is a problem. Right now, um, I'm pretty much just assuming that uh, the validation will take care of it. Um, but but there again, like that. Some of that could be a property of the relationship it's itself. Some things just don't last very long. Um, and, and others um, will need a time component. Like Iago 2, for example, has, uh, has a time component, right? So um, my system right now does not take that into account at all. But the, the problem is that uh, very often we just don't find uh, that fact somewhere in text that uh, uh, that an event stopped, right? So we find that uh, somebody is president, and then we find that somebody else is president, but we see 
the fact that the first person is not president anymore, uh, not expressed very often in text. For that, we had to yeah. access external constraints. So, that, um, like, for example, just, in just to, sorry, sorry, uh, just to wrap up that discussion, I think you make a good point. And the, perhaps the suggestion there would be that, you know, it goes back to Amit's point whether you're mining Twitter or mm -hmm. you're mining Wikipedia is the issue of corpus selection. Mm -hmm. And I think it does matter where your evidence is coming from. So it may be an issue of how much you trust the source and goes back to some of your, some of your earlier slides yeah. that perhaps in the future building a trust model uh, as an extension of this work <coughs> where Wikipedia is trusted as a source of plastic relationship and uh, CNN or Twitter or Google News is uh, trusted more as a source of transient or factual or right. momentary relations, maybe the way to go. Yeah. So uh, just this is a side comment for uh, especially uh, the students who are interested in issues of modern science. If you um, uh, see all the advances being done on information extraction on the class of work that uh, Topher uh, presented, uh, what you can still not do is uh, the kind of examples that involve temporal thing or spatial thing. Example he gave of Dayton. Um, Ohio and uh, USA. Well, that would be possible only if you are, you know that uh, the knowledge base you're creating has a geospatial relationship. Then, if I do have that, then I can use external knowledge. Additionally, saying Dayton is in Ohio, Ohio is in USA. So these are all consistent aspects, as opposed to different top, you know, um, uh, um, uh, as opposed to different uh, objects. Um, that's one. Um, and the second thing is uh, that uh, in the, for example. In the knowledge base that we created in Tali uh, and and Woket and Simagix, um, we had the issue that uh, uh, there is only first lady. Uh, Hillary Clinton was first lady uh, before um, uh, in certain time, 1999, and then election of 2000 came, and after that Barbara Bush became first lady. And so uh, at certain point of time, that Hillary became past uh, first lady, and the new first lady is there. So there is a constraint there. That there's only one first lady at a time, and that the prior first lady becomes uh, X kind of first lady. These things um, are not going to come um, automatically, magically from just um, uh, analysis of any corpus. So this is so when when I rail against uh, you know the suggestion that give me a corpus and I'll, I'll give you all the knowledge uh, and the Google kind of philosophy. This is this is the fundamental distinction of the philosophy that you just can't do uh, uh, invent uh, the kind of stuff that is not out there. And there's so many stuff that is not out there simply in the corpus on its own. And so you have to either set up the model itself that saying that I have a geospatial relationship, I would have a temporal relationship. You, you may potentially have to uh, seed uh, you know, either from additional knowledge base like uh, link open data, geospatial thing to uh, have this information or give uh, manually give constraints as in our ontology saying, hey, um, you know, the, the time uh, relation, there's only one one to one one value for this particular entity at a time, and and uh, and uh, how do you treat the different relationship? These things uh, have uh, necessarily requires either external impetus or human involvement and so on and so forth. And that's where I'm, I think we see uh, uh, the distinction between all the large body of work that's done and what we may want to seek to do. Or may, how, how we want to distinguish ourselves. I'm done. So. Yeah. Any more student questions? We need to... Um, so... Um, I guess Gerhard is on a... Yeah, so if there are any uh, no student questions, and uh, Gerhard, if you have open questions, we can also have questions by committee alone uh, after uh, in a moment uh, but if you have open questions uh, that's also welcome now i can hold on to my questions okay <laughs>